At the start of the game, each player should collect two of the large player pawns out of the supply of their respective color. Also, they should collect one each of the five available smaller worker pawns. Collect their one large and one small player token, and also collect five guilders out of the bank. They should then take both of their player pawns and place them on the board. The first player pawn will go into the town hall, while the second one will be placed on the number five on the victory point track. Then they will take the smaller player token of their color, placing it on the guard tower space that is closest to them, keeping the larger one in front of them to signify the player's color. Each player will also receive their three majority markers in their color. You will leave these in front of you, but you will leave them with the gray side facing up. We'll explain further how these are used later. Next, take all the 50 100 point markers and place them on the board in the corner down here. Then, in this spot here, you're going to place the statue tokens. You're going to start with the number 7 on top, working all the way down in order to the number 2 on the bottom, as such. Next, take all the playing cards and divide them into 5 equal stacks ignoring the colors on the backs of the cards. Then depending on the amount of players you will take that many stacks and use them throughout the entire game. Taking the rest of the stacks of cards and placing them to the side of the board to be used as a reserve. I'm going to set up a two player game so therefore I am going to take two stacks we are going to use as play and then I can just take these three stacks place them on top of each other off to the side of the board to be used as the reserve. A two player game should resemble something along these lines. Take your five colored dice, place them to the side of the board, get your first player round marker. It's time to go. The first phase of the game is drawing cards. The first player, the person with the first player marker in front of them, will draw five cards first. You may draw cards from either one of the available decks. However, you are not allowed to look at the face of the cards as you draw them. So for instance, you can draw from here, 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 and here if you like. Then after you're finished drawing, you may turn them over to reveal what you have drawn. During this phase, if ever one of the stacks of cards runs out, you will immediately place them with the big stack that was placed to the side of the board and that would signify that this is the last round of the game. However, if the cards run out in a later phase of the game, you would still play one more round with this stack. If ever this stack ran out as well, you would just simply divide this stack into two equal parts, placing them side by side to finish the game. Phase two of the game consists of rolling the five colored dice and then placing them on the five open spaces on the board in sequential order. For instance, put the higher dice on the right side going down to the lower dice on the left. Now that you have rolled the dice, there will be two separate actions that can take place. But before I speak of those, I am going to change this blue one to a two to demonstrate one of the actions. The first action that you're going to take is you're going to look at any one of the colored dice and see if they are either a 5 or a 6. If they are, you must receive a threat token of that colored dice. For instance, the purple 6 and the brown 5 means that each player now will receive one purple threat token and one brown token. The next action that you can take after the dice are rolled is to determine if a player starting with the first player wishes to advance on the reputation track. To be able to advance on the reputation track, you add up the total sum of every one and two pip dice that you have rolled. So in this instance, we only rolled a two on this blue die. However, let's change this yellow one to a one. We'll push that down to there. And now that we have a 1 and a 2, that would mean that it would cost us 3 guilders to advance 1 space on the reputation track. Starting with the first player, they would pay out of their supply, put it into the bank, 
take their person out of the town hall and place them on the number one slot on the track. That would conclude phase two. Roll the dice. For every five or six, take a threat token of that specific color of die. Advance on the reputation track the total value of each one and two pip dice combined. You may only advance one space per round. Now we'll begin phase three of the game, which is playing the cards that we have drawn off of these two stacks. We have player one and player two. Each person has five cards in their hand. During this phase, you're going to play a total of four of the cards that you have drawn. You're going to perform one of the six possible actions that are listed on the cards. We're going to cover each one of these actions in detail. Let's look at player one's hand as an example. The first action we're going to cover is taking two workers out of the supply. Let's put all these cards together because it is not important for us to look at each individual card. Each card has the exact same banner listed down the right hand side that shows you all the possible actions that you can take with each card and they are all exactly the same. Depending on the color of the banner, the first action would allow you to take two workers from the supply of that color and add them to your worker's supply as such. You would simply take this card and you would discard it, take the two workers, and then that would end the first action of your turn. The next action that you can do is you can take the number of guilders from the supply or the bank based upon the value of the dice rolled on the player board. So in this example, if you wish, you could discard this card here, taking five guilders from this bank and adding them to your supply. As such, that would end your action and then it would pass back over to the first player. The next action we're going to cover is discarding a card to be able to dismiss or remove a threat token. Listed right here on this brown card is the action. If you wish, discard this card, then allowing you to take this threat token, put it back into the general supply out of your supply, and allowing you also to move up one victory point on the track. The fourth type of action that you can perform is building a canal. To be able to build a canal, you simply discard the colored card and then you will take one canal piece and you are going to add it to the left or the right side of your guardhouse. It is important to note that it must match the color of the card that you dismissed. For instance, you could not discard a yellow card and place a canal token on a brown space. The next action we're going to cover is building a house. Now we're back to first player's turn and if he decided to, he could simply take any one of his three cards, turn them upside down, and build a house. Building a house allows you to put residents inside of them, but we're going to cover that in just a second. The final action you can take is recruiting a person. Let's once again look at player one's hand. Up here in the top left hand corner tells you the amount of guilders it takes to recruit the person. For instance, this player here, the abbot, takes nine guilders to recruit, whereas this monk takes zero. So, if you wish, you could take this monk and place him directly into an empty house in your player area. Once you do that, no other resident will be able to occupy that house. One resident per house. Because he costs zero guilders, you don't have to necessarily pay anything out of your supply to the bank. Now there are actions that you're going to be able to perform with this card, but we're going to cover those in just a minute. All the possible actions that you can take. For now, that, are the, that is the six actions you can take on your turn when playing cards out of your hand. Now, why don't we go over the actions of the actual cards and what do they mean? On your turn, you may activate one or more of your people. Now, it's important to note that you may only activate these people once per round, and sometimes they are activated immediately when they're played, as such as the monk. The little symbol here with the downward arrow means that as soon as he is placed into a residency house, you will perform the text as follows. That is a one-time effect and you will never be able to perform that for the rest of the game. Whenever you place into a residency someone that has a colored worker inside the box, then that means that you must pay that worker back to the bank to be able to perform this action. Remember, only once per round. 
So for instance, this nobleman, nobleman will give you one victory point and two guilders as long as you spend one red worker and place it into the bank. Now I put three people here and the reason is is because the infinity loop has three different types of things that can ha happen and these happen just automatically. Let's go over each one of these real quick. This one here is an every time. So for instance, during phase one, you may draw six cards instead of just five. This one here would say once per round, you may take a worker of any color. And this one here is just that whenever you actually perform taking guilders off the die for that action that is listed right here, and it's only for the brown die, that you would actually get an extra guilder. So you have to actually perform the action to be able to gain this ability. This one here, you actually have to, it just happens automatically at the beginning of the phase. And then this one here happens once per round, automatically. Last but not least, we have end of the game scoring. Whenever you have this laurel here, that means that this character is going to give you victory points at the end of the game. So for instance, this character here would allow you to get victory points for every other character that's in play that has this little dagger, it's Underworld, down here in the bottom left hand corner. After each player has played a total of four cards out of their hand, we would go to the end of the round. Now we're going to determine majority in three distinctive areas. The first we'll cover is people that you have recruited directly in front of you. In this case, player one has recruited two people, whereas player two has only recruited one. In this case, player one would then flip over this tile showing that at the end of the game, they are going to score four victory points because at one time during the game, they had the majority of people on the board. The next one we're going to look at is built canals. Player one has not built any canals, whereas player two has built one canal. In this case, player two then would get majority in the canals and flip that over and that would always be active no matter what. You can never lose majority even though you may lose majority and somebody else may be able to flip over their token. The next one we'll go over is reputation in the town hall. Well neither player has placed anywhere on the reputation track so therefore neither player would have majority. So neither player then would flip over their token showing that they've had majority. Now that that has happened each player then would go back to phase one, which would be draw cards. Once one of these stacks runs out, it would signify the end of the game. And then we would go to the end game scoring at the end of that round, as long as this happened at the beginning of phase one. If it happened at phase three, because there are cards that will allow you to draw cards, you would then, remember, you would place this deck into the, the available space, and then you would continue with the game. Now. Once the game does end, you would go into final scoring. Why don't we show you all the possible ways to score? The first way to score is based upon the amount of people you have recruited in front of you. In this instance, we have two characters. One costs us nine guilders, and at the end of the game, he is going to give us a total of three victory points. This character here costs us zero guilders, therefore he will also give us zero victory points at the end of the game. You will also score victory points based upon how many houses that you have in play. So for instance, this person has built three total houses. Therefore, will gain three victory points at the end of the game. You can also score victory points by the characters that had the laurel at the end of the game. In this case, this person called the imposter says that you will score two victory points for every character that is an underworld. Well, in front of him, he has two characters that are underworld, so therefore he would score four bonus victory points at the end of the game. Score the victory points listed on any of your majority markers. In this case, the blue player had scored eight bonus points at the end of the game because at one time he had majority on the amount of people he had recruited and also in the town hall. Also, you will gain victory points depending upon where you were on the reputation track. For instance, the blue player would gain three victory points at the end of the game while the yellow player would only score two victory points. You'll gain victory points depending on how many canal pieces you have placed as well. The yellow player to the left of the guardhouse has built to the number 5 space, but to the right only to the second space. As long as you build to the number 3 space, you will gain 3 victory points for each one of the spaces you have built. So in this example, the yellow player will gain 3 additional victory points at the end of the game. However, keep in mind, 
The yellow player also built the number 5 space, thus you would also take into account any statues that the player may have obtained while building the canal. Add those victory points as well. There are a total of five different threat markers, and we're going to cover each one of them. Whenever you receive your third threat marker and you complete the pie, you will then suffer the consequence of that threat. Why don't we cover each one of these and show you just exactly how threatening these could possibly be. The first one to cover is the raid. That's the yellow. Anytime you would ever obtain your third yellow, you would automatically lose all of your guilders and have to return them to the supply. Let's say you ever get your third blue one. The third blue one would force you to take all of your workers out of your supply and return them to the bank. Whenever you receive your third red one, it means that you will, you will either have to remove one of your houses or one of your canal pieces off of the board. If you decide to remove one of your houses, if you ever have somebody that's occupying that house, that person would be placed into your hand, however, the house would be removed and discarded. If ever you get your third brown one, you would then have to decide to remove one of your players that is in front of you from the game. Last but not least, if you ever get your third purple one, you just simply lose three victory points. Whoever has the most victory points at the end of the game wins. In the case of the tie, whoever has the most guilders will end up winning. Thank you for watching. Bye bye.